Hi everyone, we're just going to wait a few more minutes because we've got quite a few people who have registered for this session before we crack on. It's really great to see so many uh, names that I recognise from across the making spectrum. Okay. I think that's my cue to get going. So I will do this creative practices that trade lightly on the earth, a workshop to develop a sustainable low carbon studio, which is part of the Maker Green Maker initiative launched by the EDRF Low Carbon Devon University of Plymouth and the Devon Guild of Craftsmen. My name is Polly McPherson and I'm Associate Head of School for Enterprise, leading the Knowledge Exchange, Creative Industries, Industries and Enterprise within the School of Art, Design and Architecture here at the University of Plymouth. I'm a, uh, a Professor of Design and I work with an internationally acclaimed group of practitioners who teach the designing, creating, making of objects and artefact. I have a background in making with a specialism in ceramics and I'm particularly interested in how things are made how things can be made ethically and sustainably, and how we can teach this. Additional to this, I am the Low Carbon Devon Creative Industry Supervisor, and I've been working with our research fellow who's here today, um, uh, Dr. Emma Whitaker, who with colleagues has worked very hard to make this workshop happen. My job today is as chair is to welcome you all, uh, to introduce the, the speakers and to try to keep us all to time. But more importantly, my job is also to ask the speakers questions that you might have. Please put them in the chat and I will look to ask them as the time goes on. So let's get going. I'm delighted to be able to introduce you to Laura Wasley. Laura is the CEO of the Devon Guild of Craftsmen based here at, in Bovey, uh, Tracy in Devon and Dr. Emma Whitaker, who is the Low Carbon Devon's Creative Industries Research Fellow, based here again uh, at the University of Devon, uh, sorry, University of Plymouth. And, um, sorry, my screen's going a bit funny, that's why I'm muttering. Um, and they will be introducing to you the Green Maker Initiative. So over to you, Laura and Emma. Um, hi everyone, I um, hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Laura Wosley and I'm the CEO of the Devon Guild of Craftsmen. We are an education charity funded by the Arts Council and we are based in a grade two listed water mill on the edge of Dartmoor in Bubby Tracy, as you can see. Um, our mill houses three gallery spaces. Uh, we host national and regional exhibitions. We have an education space for people to engage in making and we run an outreach programme called Made by Hand, which provides hands-on learning for placing professional makers and artists in schools and communities. We also have a shop and an online shop which supports our maker members in selling their work. Today we have over 300 maker members based around the southwest with a huge range of skills from glass, ceramic, jewellery and furniture making. Embracing our environmental responsibility is at the top of our agenda and it's so important for our organisation. Our aim is to set an example to our maker community by demonstrating our impact in reducing our carbon footprint to educate, encourage and support makers to do so. Last summer, I met with Paul Reid from Drift Advice and Dr Emma Whitaker from Plymouth University and Low Carbon Devon to start to develop an exciting new project where we can celebrate and encourage environmentally sustainable craft practices within Devon and the Southwest with the new Green Maker initiative. So um, Emma is going to tell you all about it. Hello everyone and thank you for coming to the um, workshop today. So just to give you a little um, overview, so the um, Green Maker Initiative is in collaboration with um, Devon Guild of Craftsmen, um, as Laura's introduced, and also the Low Carbon Devon Project, which is an EDRF funded project at University of Plymouth. And the um, Low Carbon Devon project has a range of different activities. So it involves the retrofit of the sustainability hub for which it's won the skier gold rating for the renovations, carbon reduction program in the university buildings, 
There's a knowledge exchange and internship program fully funded and um, support for Devon SMEs and also um, research in green living walls, energy efficient buildings and occupant behavior, power electronics and the creative industries. And in the creative industries area, one of the activities that we're engaging with is working with organizations such as the Devon Guild um, and um, Laura and I've been working together to, to create the Green Maker Initiative. And it's um, very much um, responding to and um, developing from the excellent work at Creative Carbon Scotland. And uh, Caro Ofery is here today from Creative Carbon Scotland. So we're, we're lucky to, to have her as well as all of the other brilliant speakers who are going to be talking to you today in their own areas of expertise. So um, we've developed the Green Maker Initiative um, based on that that model and evolving it um, in the, the Southwest context. And just to give you a little brief overview, and you can find more details on the Green Maker Initiative pages of the Devon Guild website. But first of all, it's just to highlight that you don't have to be a member of the Devon Guild to be a member of the Green Maker Initiative. The Devon Guild have very kindly agreed to host it, supported by um, Low Carbon Devon. But anyone, we're inviting everyone to inv uh, to join the, the Green Maker Initiative and um, use the free resources that we're offering. So um, the, we're inviting you to join the, the Green Maker Pledge and badge, the membership badge, um, which has um, been de designed by um, two 3D design um, BA students, graduate students from um, University of Plymouth. Um, and that will be released very soon. Um, so the, it's about completing a yearly informal report to monitor, manage and reduce the impact on the environment of the, of the maker practices. Um, one of the other benefits is to be listed on the Guild website to display the membership credentials on makers own publicity to spread the word. And um, there are going to be a range of um, green maker resources available, uh, including carbon um, footprint measurement tools, um, access to recycle and share of waste materials so makers can um, make use of others' waste to, to create um, work, and helping makers reduce their environmental impact by providing workshops such as this one, support and networks. Um, so we invite you to join. And um, we have another workshop coming up, which um, I just quickly flashed the screen out, Plastic Alchemy, but we'll talk more about that later. So um, thank you. Thank you to all the speakers and um, I hope everyone enjoys the workshop. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Laura and Emma. So, I just need to move something out of the way. Okay, so our first speakers are, Dr. Laura England and Julian Ledman. Laura is, uh, sorry, my computer's getting funny. Um, Laura is a Baxter Fellow in Creative Economies at the Duncan Jordanson College of Art and Design at the University of Dundee. Her research explores creative ecologies in both Global North and the Global South contexts with a focus on the crafts sector. Laura, Sorry, Lauren. Lauren. <laughs> Lauren conducted her PhD at King's College London and um, in did this in collaboration with the Doctoral College. So, God, I'm craft council. Sorry, my phone is going a bit funny and the screen is going a bit funny. Um, I'm hoping that you can still see me okay. Can I have somebody tell me that they can see me? Yep. We can see you, Polly. Thank you. Okay, okay. apologies for that. So, and apologies for Lauren. Um, Lauren uh, conducted her BH, PhD at King's College London uh, and was worked with this in the collaboration of the doctorate with the Craft Council UK. Julian is a designer maker whose design are based on research and exploration of ideas, creating narrative around core concepts. His work ranges from producing pieces for private commissions that utilize sustainable materials to, uh, to large scaled fabricated work uh, for other design studios, uh, such as Max Lamb, Peter Marigold, and Tim Norris. He's exhibited widely, including the Aram Gallery in London and the Worshipful Company of Furniture Makers in London. So over to you two, Lauren and Julian. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. My name is Julian Leadham, like I said. Um, I'm a London-based designer maker. 
I make, yeah, sustainable fur furniture, mostly, predominantly. Um, I also, however, yeah, fabricate for other studios and designers, and that's already been kind of like detailed. Um, in 2017, I founded uh, Various Studios, which is a communal studio uh, for like-minded designers, makers, um, but it also acts as a way to put on group exhibitions for said designers and makers and anyone else that, you know, was in, in that network. Um, during lockdown, various studios became the digital platform for crafting a circular economy, which is the project that Lauren is now going to describe to you. Um, during COVID, a lot of kind of the various studio side of life um, has kind of become paused and but slowly it's coming back and there is a uh, gathering momentum and projects and stuff in the pipeline that will hopefully uh, come to light soon um so for the time being i'll pass you on to lauren uh, she can take you through the crafting and circular economy project that we did at king's college and then i'll come back to talk a little bit more about the practical sides of sustainability from my workshop Thanks, Julian. Hopefully everyone can see the slides that I'm sharing. I think that was a nod. Great. Thanks. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Lauren England. I'm, as Polly said, I'm based at the Duncan of Jordanson College of Art and Design at the University of Dundee, where my research is about creative economies um, in a very interdisciplinary way. Um, but my focus has really been on the craft sector and work of craft and designer makers. So the PhD uh, with Crafts Council UK was about professional development in craft higher education and thinking about sustainable business development, mostly from a kind of economic sustainability perspective. But increasingly now, um, while after my PhD, I was a, a lecturer at, at King's in the culture, media and creative industries department um, and tending to look more at the kind of environmental um, sustainability aspect of uh, craft and designer makers so and that's the project that we're um, going to talk about today but to start off with as we've called our project crafting a secular economy for those of you who uh, may or may not be you know particularly familiar with the secular economy concept and it's as it as a system um, this has really been kind of championed by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and I definitely you know for the more kind of in-depth discussion around what is the circular economy and, and how it applies to different industries I definitely advise you to check out uh, their website which has has uh, a lot of really great resources um, and more detailed discussions about what a circular economy is and the different kind of the different flows within it um, but really the circular economy has kind of been positioned as this way of alleviating pressure and maintaining and re replenishing the world's resources uh, as a way of also kind of helping us to quite radically rethink how, where, why we make things and what we consume. Um, so while we use the, the, the terminology of circular economy as the kind of title uh, for our project in, in this work, we were really quite interested also in the kind of wider debate about being environmentally sustainable, uh, ethical practice, things about kind of local manufacturing systems, opportunities and challenges that were presented in rethinking uh, craft production. Um, and we, we were looking at craft both from a kind of, from our own personal interest in the sector, but also uh, in relation to the circular economy, particularly with the potential for uh, closing and shortening of product and material loops, um, and thinking about some of the practices that are already quite embedded in the way that we, we saw craft businesses models being adopted and adapted, uh, thinking about kind of extending the life cycle of products, making from waste materials, developing new biodegradable ones, um, so we found that there are kind of examples of people kind of repairing, refurbishing, reusing, recycling products, uh, all the way to kind of developing service models. So for us, what we what we were seeing kind of more anecdotally rather than captured in any research was that designer and designers and makers were already kind of integrating some circular design practices into their businesses and their ways of working. Um, but also that there were some quite quite considerable challenges in doing so. So that was what uh, the kind of remit for, for our project was, uh, was to look a bit more in depth in that. Um, but we were already seeing craft makers as, as, a, as a group who can also kind of excel in creating this long-term attachment and trust between their products and their consumers. Um, you know, as thinking about how they can embed really valuable narratives into their products through the making processes um, in a way that can also prolong the life cycle of the product itself. So 
if the success of a circular economy really depends on new business models that are able to kind of truly capitalize on longer product lifespans over time, we think that craft businesses and, and practices may offer some really key insights that can be beneficial both to the sector itself, but also to uh, larger sectors and, and other industries. So for this, this project, uh, in early 2020, while I was at uh, King's College, we were awarded some funding um, from the college and also an ESRC Impact Acceleration Award to do a sort of some initial kind of scoping and partnership building uh, around uh, the, the issues that were being raised around craft and designer makers engaging with the circular economy. So this was a collaborative project between both myself and Julian, but also we were working with uh, biomaterials expert Zoe Powell and Pilar Bonamburu at Materium, who are biomaterials experts. Uh, we were also supported by Craft Council UK and Cockpit Arts. Uh, and really the aim of the project was to build a greater understanding of the work of craft and designer makers, individuals and organizations who are engaging with the circular economy and uh, both the opportunities and challenges that were arising there. So. The aim of the project was kind of to develop initially to develop a network and kind of a map of individuals, businesses and resources that can support sustainable development of craft and design, uh, identifying some potential gaps or missing connections in order to support further collaboration and knowledge sharing. Um, and just from from Emma's initial in, introduction to the Greenmaker Initiative, I can see some really great kind of um, potential kind of parallels with, with what's going on there in Devon. Um, that'd be great to hopefully follow up with afterwards. but. Um, Due to the you know, very small size and duration of this project, um, the initial work was really about kind of supporting an initial development of the network and identifying some initial kind of uh, themes and opportunities for designer makers to adopt circular design systems, practices and business models. Um, as Julia mentioned, kind of COVID has obviously had a quite a significant impact on most of our activities. Um, it Initially, really what it meant for this project was that every activity had to move online uh, before we were all really okay with how to work in the world of Zoom. Um, so that was a real learning process for us, but it, it had some advantages in that previously our project had been quite London focused in that we were based at King's College London are going to be having physical events there, um, but we were able to expand to a, a wider uh, national and, and in some areas international engagement with the project which was which was great um, and as students mentioned kind of currently COVID and also the end of our project funding has meant that we're sort of paused on a few of these aspects um, and are kind of taking this time to reflect and, and and evaluate and see what what areas to take forward and what new partnerships might be needed to do that. So to give you a little bit of kind of insight into what we what we developed through the project um, this this screenshot here is of a, a Padlet that we developed through a network meeting of various resources uh, that designers and makers either were using themselves or were aware of uh, that could you know, help either um, facilitate more sustainable business practices and making uh, or also just kind of be sources of information, products, services uh, and other opportunities to support their work. So um, this was kind of a crowdsourced resources and it was made available freely accessible by the various studios website and is still up there now if you'd like to have a scroll through it. Um, and this, oh, sorry, I'm skipping on my slides. There we go. Uh, Yes, so it, there is also, I think, still the option to be able to uh, to add to the Padlet um, if you have additional resources. And this is something that we will um, probably look to, to develop over time, um, depending on what direction our project goes. But this was one of the kind of main outputs that, that came out of the project. The other was uh, creating a space for designers, makers, and those engaged with the circular economy to share their stories. Um, on the website again as well, these are available to, to go and read if you're interested in seeing how the, a few organisations were approaching this in their practice um, and also the challenges and opportunities that they were coming up against, both in kind of engaging in, in sustainable making practices and around also around kind of their affinity with the term circular economy. Um, and the profiles that you'll, you'll be able to find on there, um, ones for Little Hands Designs, who are a... Um, they're based in Hampstead and they work with recycling kind of textiles, textiles materials and lots of kind of ed educational and, and community based work. Uh, Tambi Kant, who is a jeweler working with reusing sari material uh, and making practices, um, also just you know, um, it's teaching workshops um, and engagement with, with communities around kind of using 
waste materials. And Louisa Rodriguez, who is a kind of interdisciplinary um, installation artist and sort of with an architecture background, thinking about kind of public uh, public works and reusing materials. And Julian's going to talk a little bit more about a project with Louisa that came out of this project a bit later on. Um, and there are some more stories on there. So um, this is really a, a space that we wanted to create to um, kind of both showcase some makers who took part in our project and also to uh, give some insights and in some some practices and, and some of the kind of challenges that people were coming up against already as a kind of learning resource. Um, finally, um, one another part of the project was about doing a very initial exploration um, with materials about capturing a waste stream from a, a creative studio. So for this, we used um, sawdust from Julian's workshop. Um, and this was about kind of experimenting, working with um, Zoe and Pilar from Materium uh, to think through you know, potential uh, uses of a waste stream material, um, thinking about kind of both the material elements of it, how it could be shaped, how it could be performed, how it could be worked with, what the potential applications were for it, but also in thinking through some of the issues that emerge in trying to kind of create new um, materials um, in terms of time, resources, space, sourcing, application. Um, and a technical report for this is also available on the various studios website, if that's something that you're um, interested to kind of delve into. In terms of what kind of the, the themes that came out of the network discussions, um, it was that there were a number of ways that designers and makers were already engaging with kind of elements of the circular economy, whether that was in their business models, um, which were largely remaining product orientated and kind of producing products to sell. Um, but there was also elements of that were being built into that, whether that was about creating uh, kind of advice or guidance sheets for consumers about the products in relation to its use, its care, potentially repair instructions, and that being kind of fundamental to how their products were were kind of brought to market. Um, additional kind of examples were about people building kind of repair systems or kind of the ideas of developing maintenance contracts um, or take back agreements when a project reaches its end of life. So there were a number of ways that people were either both already um, employing in their own practice or kind of thinking about developing uh, in relation to um, kind of more sustainable models. Design was probably one of the key areas where we were seeing um, more kind of established circular practices, um, whether that's designed for durability, so really developing products that can, can last a long time, or will, will stand a lot of wear and tear, and therefore kind of are in the loop for longer, uh, and particularly around kind of designing out waste, um, kind of taking a zero waste approach to their making, or designing with waste materials, or kind of taking sort of an industrial symbiosis approach, looking at kind of off off-cut materials from other industries that could be used um, in making practices. So again, the, the making aspect um, of a craft, of a craft business and a craft practice was another area where the kind of leveraging that what, what is referred to kind of um, in circular economy terms as the power of the inner circle, which is about kind of minimizing material usage compared to a, a linear approach, um, or and also kind of that power of circling longer. So maximizing the number of consecutive cycles that a product or material might go through uh, and its time in each cycle before a product reaches its end of life. Other aspects that we identified were in, particularly in the use of materials. Um, so whether that's using recycled biomaterials or natural materials and dyes, um, using waste materials, as we just mentioned, um, reclaiming materials. Um, so some craft materials that are being used are kind of biological in origin, whether that's kind of wood, natural fibres. Um, others are more technical materials. I think about kind of plastics, uh, glass, some metals. Um, and in, in working towards kind of circular systems or more sustainable practices, uh, the craft sector, I think there is also some particular considerations that need to be given to both models of production uh, and consumption, but also the kind of the, the material dimension of it. Um, and there are some quite specific disciplinary chapters challenges for the sector and that highlight the needs for quite kind of specific um, specific kind of practices, um, whether that's from kind of various aspects of the supply chain, considering each material practice, um, how some craft practices are particularly energy intensive compared to others and their production processes. Others might rely on a mining of natural resources, which both has environmental and social ramifications. Um, so really what, what we kind of unearthed was, was a great deal of complexity in developing circular practices, um, as well as some of the ways that they were already being applied. Um, and really a, a potential kind of 
challenge to the sector to really quite radically rethink the way it engages with global supply chains and manufacturing processes and think about so the potential to scale up. Um, so I, I put this quote here on, on the slide saying, you know, it, at an individual level, thinking through how your practice can become more sustainable is obviously very valuable in terms of its own kind of individual impact on, on the environment, but also thinking about the potential for uh, the scaling up of practices that can have a much larger impact on industry and, and large scale manufacturing. Um, one area that we also saw an additional kind of engagement with, with aspects of the circular economy and sustainability practices was in studio management. Um, so when that came down to kind of the leasing of workshops and studio spaces by individuals or collectives, um, about kind of renting models, sharing of space, equipment and machinery. Um, so the use of that applied in, that in shared studios or in maker spaces. Um, so that kind of pooling of resources um, and, and the use of shared space equipment um, and also fuel sources and materials to try and make a practice more sustainable rather than each individual going out and do it on, on their own. So. What this all kind of suggested was that the craft sector, it, it's supporting a wider uptake and development of, of circular or sustainable models, um, but there are some quite significant challenges um, that the sector faces and that really also collaboration is really quite key here. And I think, I know Julian's gonna talk a bit more about that um, in his part. So a, a kind of a summary of the main challenges we found is that it was largely around kind of scaling up in a sustainable way. You know, how do you keep your supply of resources going? Um, how do you keep being sustainable with the, the more you're producing? Um, issues around kind of effective supply chains, continuity of supply, um, and particularly if in, in using or making biomaterials, if that's an area that, that the makers are trying to get into, is how do you do that at scale? Um, so this, this issue of scaling up really kind of came through in a number of areas. Um, general lack of transparency in the supply chain generally making it quite hard for kind of makers to, to identify what would be a sustainable um, material to use um, and also the kind of the, the cost and time associated with both working with or developing new sustainable materials and practices you know the amount of time and resources that needs to go into uh, doing it sustainably um, I think is not not to be underestimated um, and also some so concerns over balancing sustainability also with the ethical dimensions and thinking about kind of um, the, the social ramifications of, of some um, material origins or, or material practices. That being said, there were some opportunities that we also identified um, thinking about kind of the, the potential to really recover and generate value um, through the use of um, what are perceived to be waste materials um, particularly around the areas of kind of design studio waste or byproduct materials and how that that kind of a, an additional loop for that material can be created and also with added value. Thinking about also the potential for using existing um, machinery and facilities in studios to potentially pre-process waste materials into more usable formats, whether that's for other makers uh, or for the use in, in wider industry and a kind of looking towards industry symbiosis. Uh, Thinking about using uh, using and sourcing local materials to mitigate carbon footprints, um, and and also with coming back to that kind of collaboration again, thinking about material and product partnerships that can really bring together different areas of expertise, um, or whether that's about kind of product um, pooling resources around kind of space, equipment, and funding, etc. And so that really highlighted some some key opportunities around like networks and sharing, whether that's about leveraging kind of shared facilities and workspaces, um, sharing systems for resources with collective or shared studios, um, clustering and, and shortening supply chains. Um, and that's the, 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 uh, the elements of kind of the, the waste um, sort of resources that, that Emma mentioned with the with the Green Maker initiative about thinking about kind of sharing resource pools, you know, that, that speaks to that um, very clearly. Also thinking about developing knowledge of who has particular resources and waste streams, as well as the access to them. Um, and also for the potential for more open source information and other resources and toolkits to be shared so that, you know, information about how to be sustainable or, or develop sustainable practices um, is more widely available and demonstrated and easy to access. So while over the, you know, what we found amongst the makers that we engaged with, that there was quite a concern of kind of misuse or misattribution of being sustainable, being green. You know, there was concerns over greenwashing, 
do you call yourself circular? Do you call yourself sustainable? Do you call yourself green? You know, are, are you uh, appropriately using those terms in application to your practice? Is that something you want to associate with? Um, but also what it, it kind of emerged that it's really important to avoid you know, presenting this binary opposition between being sustainable or unsustainable, ethical or not ethical. Um, and that this was really it's, it's an ongoing conversation. Um, the work of designers and makers has this quite a strong potential to communicate these issues and, and to make complex terms more accessible. So to not kind of take yourself out of the equation um, because you're not 100 percent there yet. Um, just kind of about the importance of, of maintaining dialogue with other makers, with wider industry in relation to policy um, and thinking about kind of the, the long term trajectory of becoming sustainable rather than kind of uh, saying that, that that's not something I'm, I'm doing fully myself already and, and, and seeing that as a barrier to engaging. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Julian, who's going to give a bit more background about kind of his own experience um, of developing more sustainable practices. Um, hi again. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so firstly, I'm just going to say um, I'm not really a talker. Um, <laughs> I spend most of my time sitting in front of uh, my computer, either designing or a lot of time Jen, at the studio uh, making. Uh, so hopefully what, I, uh, what we discuss now will be useful um, and definitely not boring, but time will tell. Um, Firstly, I think it's really important to actually think about what sustainability means, uh, definitely from your perspective, your own perspective, but also as a creative practice, what does it mean to your creative practice? And that then influences how the rest of the world will engage with you. Uh, for me, it's a far reaching and convoluted topic, which I think, you know, that's been described by Lauren. You can see how much there's going on with the circular economy, the green and environmental issues and upscaling. And, you know, there's so much going on and it can seem um, like countless hurdles. Um, it's also filled with loads and loads and loads of jargon and a fair amount of greenwashing. Um, also, sustainability is definitely a bit of a buzzword. Um, so it gets overused quite a bit and therefore can be interpreted in quite, uh, quite differently. And to some extent, this makes it almost harder to find, not easier. So this means, leads me down to the decision that we should definitely ponder what it is to be sustainable and how as a creative practice, how you decide to use that terminology and whether you use it as a promotional device, as a selling tool, or you just choose not to. Um, Personally, I don't really use it as a promotional tool. Uh, I, I don't call myself Mr. Sustainable, um, fundamentally because I don't think any practice can be 100% sustainable. Um, I think it's something that you work towards uh, and you take a step and then you take another step and then you take another step. Now, that may be wrong um, uh, and maybe someone can turn around and tell me that they are, but um, I think the world is slowly getting better and better with ideas of sustainability and environmental impacts. But until we reach a point where you have, say, material passports and really open, transparent supply chains, um, and you can deal with issues like um, upscaling and your, your business when you get a massive amount of orders in, then it's definitely quite tricky. Um, so therefore, I kind of stick away from it a little bit. Um, and I think it's probably quite easy to misrepresent yourself. That said, as a selling tool, um, you know, when I'm chatting like one-to-one -one with clients, I probably don't actually use the word, word sustainable, but I do use reclaimed or perhaps saved from landfill or, the, you know, whatever you think is apparent or useful. Uh, but that's a very much a judgment call. Um, yeah. And also probably very much dependent on the type of practice that you're involved with or thinking to undertake. For me, um, yeah. And also for the people that I've worked with, um, they don't seem to really cling to terminologies. Um, I don't really go up and the pieces that I've done for fabrications, that they've said, oh, this is a sustainable project. 
Um, I think it's more about selling yourself and the art and the piece that you're making um, as opposed to the idea of sustainability. Um, and I think that breeds kind of like a, a longer leg, leg, longevity to your work. Um, because then obviously you're promoting yourself and, and not, not a terminology, which could in future years be but you know badly labeled or again misrepresented. Um, for me, sustainability is definitely more of a moral obligation. It's uh, a sense of doing the right thing, which is attached to whatever I do. Now, whether that's the various studios and the how we operate with communal tools or it's an actual piece of furniture. Um, it's, it's embedded in the pieces and my working practice. It's not something that I promote and it's not the thing that is leading the way, if that makes sense. Um, I believe that if you're passionate about something you strive to make it sustainable in time, the people that as you promote that, your work will become apparent uh, and you're kind of speaking more through your actions as opposed to selling yourself. Um, regardless of all of that, it all starts with a commission anyway. Um, you can create work off your own bat and you know that could be the, one of the most sustainable pieces possible. But if you're making something just for making sake, then there's a lot of energy and time and resources that have gone into that thing. And it might just end up sitting on, on a shelf, uh, you know, gathering dust. So there's, then you've misspent all of that. Um, so now I've kind of detailed some of the issues around sustainability for me, um, the image that you're seeing is one of my first uh, private commissions. Uh, it's a drinks cabinet. Um, the clients were amazing. Uh, they gave me a huge amount of freedom. Um, they were happy to pay what I asked for. And they kind of let me take as long as I needed to actually make the piece. Um, to contradict this, I probably spent far too many hours on it. I didn't charge enough. And I probably bit off more than I could chew. Um, um, it's fairly hard to say why they commissioned the piece at the end of the day, but I, I definitely know that when we were talking, they were very happy about the use of reclaimed materials. And in that regard, you have two major elements that are uh, reclaimed in this piece. One is the oak, the, the octagons that you can see. They were initially old oak flooring, um, which I kind of had to chop through the bandsaw and make various jigs uh, and make hundreds and hundreds of octagons that wrap around um, all of the sides and top of the unit. And the second element is the brass fittings, which came from a salvage yard. And I, you know, refurnished and refurbished them, um, eventually attaching them to the unit. Um, the main body internally is um, off the shelf kind of materials. So it's actually black velcromat. Um, but I chose again black velcromat because it didn't need it to be stained. So that's one less kind of product, one less kind of finishing, few less chemicals. And of, uh, velcromat again is kind of more environmentally friendly than its counterpart, MDF. Um, so every decision about a piece can have a sustainable slant and a more positive impact. Um, lastly, I chose the Japanese technique, uh, shosugi ban, which is uh, basically burning. Uh, so the whole unit was assembled and then all of the octagons and everything was burnt and then scrubbed, burnt, scrubbed, um, and then eventually a final layer of protection put over it. I chose that method again because I didn't want to stain it and use chemicals and, da, 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 and find it a more natural process and it will really strengthen the wood. Um, the big or major thing about doing the, this kind of work is it takes a huge amount of time to process. So turning the octagons, I could have bought them 
from some form of online and I did just attach them, but turning them from uh, old flooring um, took a huge amount of time. Um, and basically that time means that I'm entering the bespoke market. You know, all of that time has to be charged and basically means that the clients that I'm looking for are have disposable income. It also means that this, um, mass production is a bit of a no-go, uh, which is fine for me because I definitely, as a practice, prefer to work either in unique pieces or small batch. Um, and small batch works very much in the sense that, you know, if you've got a material in, then you can only make as many as that material will provide. Otherwise, again, you're getting into the problems of scaling up and having to source new materials, which then becomes like, well, do I chop down X amount of trees? Do I just buy it? Then it, you know, it, it challenges that, that idea. Um, however, it's definitely, as Lauren describes, it's upscaling is definitely something that needs to be tackled. Um, back in the day, William Morris tried it and failed. Um, so it's definitely, it's a challenge and it's one that, you know, um, hopefully someone will get right somewhere, but I believe every kind of situation presents more problems. So unless you can solve the problems that you're creating along the way as well, you might just find yourself creating more than you're solving. Um, okay, uh, moving on, if I get the next slide up, um, I wanted to show you this project um, because this was, um, although all of the wooden slats in this are all from offcuts from my studio or other studios, um, realistically, this piece is all about collaboration. Um, firstly, it started with uh, our crafting a circular economy and Louisa, who attended, uh, she came up to me at the end sometime after and was like, oh, I've got this installation. Uh, would it be possible for you to make it? And of course I said, yes. Um, and then from there, we spoke about how to source the wood and the materials. Um, a lot of the materials came from uh, the RAF Hendon Museum in a, in a previous exhibition. A lot came from my studio. And then another batch came from the offcuts from another studio. Uh, and again, it took a, a huge amount of time to process all of those slats to make them. Uh, they all have to be the correct width and size and artistically they have to like make the overall aesthetic work. Um, but um, yeah, collaboration is key for this piece. And also it's a great way of, of networking and soon in future years you might end up talking to those people again more work comes comes about and or you end up hiring people um yeah one second um so for me you know it's it's, it's quite easy to pull and source materials um for a, a required project for one required bespoke project and it doesn't take too much time for me to say denail a piece of wood and put it through the planer. Um, however, in projects like this, where you've got 12 square meters, uh, it can take a huge amount of time. Uh, and it's definitely something that you want to quote for correctly. Um, that said, the, the good aspect of that is uh, and you're basically taking, um, or you're moving material costs to labor costs. So instead of giving your suppliers and larger companies and entities, your hard-earned cash, you're keeping it for your own back pocket, um, which has obviously got to be a plus for, for most people. Um, I'm gonna, so lastly, uh, I'll talk about um, a manifesto. And when I first left university, I attended a talk where someone mentioned this, having a studio manifesto. And I think it's a really, smart idea uh, and for those that are prepared to do a little bit of homework um, I would say take a couple of hours to come up with 15 words that really encapsulate your creative practice try not to use buzzwords um, but words that you can really define 
and then sometime in the future those those buzzwords you can when you get a project coming in you can refer to them and look back and that's definitely been amazing helpful for me when I first uh, established myself um, and you know if you get a project that comes in and it meets your criteria then undoubtedly it will come great online content and you'll then propose and fuel yourself for the future of the same type of work. Um, a prime example of this is the next slide, uh, which is uh, a recent exhibition that I installed called Spoon Archaeology, which was uh, exhibited at the London Design Biennial. Um, it's not really work that I would normally entertain, but it is an exhibition all about sustainability and the use of single-use plastics. And it was for a friend of a friend, so why not? Um, the clients at the end of the day were really happy with the work and I ensured that the next time we, um, they wanted such work that we could make as a studio the, the whole exhibition, saving them on carbon footprint, um, shipping costs, X, Y and Z. Um, of course, um, I don't know if they will come back because it's the most recent thing, but at the same time, taking on such work is really very useful and understanding how other people see um, and deal with not only issues of sustainability, but exhibition design and everything like that, which can be very useful for uh, someone who's just starting out. Um, finally, there is of course the running of the studio. Um, so it's a communal based studio. Um, we share all the tools and equipment um, we get our electricity from renewable providers. We recycle what we can. We have LED light bulbs. It's about efficient energy in the workshop. Um, for the most part, there's kind of like that's day-to-day -day admin as I see it. Um, but all of these things are really important in taking another step towards a more sustainable working practice. Um, they're the boring steps, but they're the useful ones. Um, I think that's that's me. Um, I hope that was somehow useful. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Julian, and also for Lauren. Um, we have got a few minutes for uh, some questions. Um, I don't know if there's any. If you'd like to answer a question, um, please put your screen. Um, I'm going to start off by well, first of all, saying thank you both very much. Really interesting. I, I, I've got pages of notes here, so I could be asking all sorts of things. But I, just as, starting off with you, Julian. Um, uh, um, just, a, I was really pleased. In fact, um, it came about in both your talks. It's about this manifesto, and it's something that uh, at the University of Plymouth, in the course that I run, in the three D design course that I run, we talk about that, the importance of that. And I think there's a really interesting element there that us as individuals can be thinking about how that works, um, not just as makers, but as individuals working in, in, in well, yeah, in life, working in life. Um, so that sort of manifesto is really interesting, but and also there is that whole thing about maybe not necessarily uh, the greenwash thing. So we've got the greenwash thing, we've got um, the circular economy, we've got um, all the other bits that kind of come, all the other buzzwords, which are really interesting. And certainly from my point of view, uh, we had a situation a while back when we were advertising what we were doing, and somebody said, "Oh, we've been to so and so," and you haven't, and they always mention sustainability, but you don't mention it. And of course, what happens? is because it becomes so inbred with what you're doing, you don't necessarily, um, you don't necessarily uh, talk about it all the time. Uh, and then people don't think it's happening. So there's a, you, it's about getting that balance. So I think, I suppose my first question really to Julian is, how do you do, do that to get that balance to make sure that people are aware that you are working on the sustainable without being in your face, sort of pushing it too far forward, if that makes sense? Yeah. Uh, I think this is a really tricky question. And I think probably the answer will be quite personal to any designer or maker that you ask. Mm. Um, some people really kind of sell themselves as sustainable. Uh, Sebastian Cox, I would say, yeah. is definitely one of the most kind of sustainable designers or makers that I know. He's very much like, you know, English woods. He has a woodland, very much... Um, about the environmental kind of the biodiversity of everything as well. Yeah. Um, other people, uh, Max Lamb, he had sustainable things, but he didn't really at all mm. label them or really call them or promote them in it. Um, personally, I probably, 
when I'm chatting with friends and other colleagues, they know that I'm kind of sustainably blind minded and we have these deep conversations or long conversations about greenwashing or this, or how do you do upscaling and upsizing? So you have these, these conversations with clients probably don't delve into it quite as deeply. You don't want to drench them in information and start talking terminologies and greenwashing and all of the, the things. So I think it really depends who you're talking to. Mm. But I, I, one of the things, of course, to thinking about what Lauren was talking about with the maker stories is actually a lot of clients quite like to know the stories behind them. And that's sort of make, particularly if you're making small production pieces or one off pieces, they like to have that information um, so that it's sort of it, it becomes that, that what they're buying and what they're seeing becomes much more personal for what they're doing. Um, and I think or what they're. Yeah. And how that's. Yeah. A narrative is super important. Yeah. For a lot of if, if you're exhibiting work, showcasing work, uh, you know, working to any form of brief, um, you know, how you weave in your story is important. But whether you oversell sustainability or undersell it, um, yeah. I think is very much dependent on the case by case. Yeah. So if we just think about that sort of, uh, and to have move on to Lauren, um, Emma's put in here about the maker stories. I don't know if you can say a little bit more about that. So it sort of moves quite quite well onto that. Yeah, of course. So the, the maker stories was uh, a kind of an online space for um, to sort of start off a, a platform for makers to showcase both their work, their practices um, and tell their story. Um, in relation to sustainability and, and uh, we didn't really kind of enforce an adherence to circular economy and that it was it was about have, having kind of an open discussion space so we 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 put them together almost in a uh we, we julian and i had you know fairly kind of informal relaxed discussions with um with makers and then formulated that into kind of story format to go on the various studios uh website um and that it covered things from someone for what their inspiration for making what it was that they were making, uh, the materials that they were using um, and connections that had with sustainability, um, challenges that they you know, individually uh, came across in terms of pursuing a sustainable practice. Uh, and also thinking about who else was in, involved, you know, who else they were they were working with, you know, thinking about like the role of networks and collaboration um, for them. So it was each story is obviously, you know, unique to each uh, group. And so between, you know, Little Hands Design are have a different approach. You know, their, their approach is much more about kind of education and um, a workshop based delivery working with um, fashion, textiles, waste materials kind of and also educating people to to be able to make things um with reused or, or recycled or reclaimed materials whereas um Tanvi is a, you know, a practicing jeweler and artist so that was more about her kind of personal practice and how she was using sari material um in to to make her jewelry um and then with Louisa it was about kind of her installation work so trying to showcase sort of a, across a range of designer makers uh, different ways um, that people were were working um, or trying to work more sustainably, and a fantastic resource for those people who are looking to to develop their pra practice in that way as well. So going okay, so how does that fit to, uh, exactly? How can I move on from there? Yeah, exactly. I think it's about you know, just having some some examples. You know, okay, what what work, what has and hasn't worked for other people, um, and that was something we we came across that people wanting just. I think with, with students in particular kind of developing their own practice in being able to to see you know professional examples of, of how this is being done um in a professional practice in a in a creative business um is, is a useful resource um to kind of just sort of dispel some of the myths of you know how how people might be going about it yeah fantastic great thank you both very much um I don't think we've got any more questions at the moment uh, we can come back to this um, so, as I say, please put some in the chat, but um, uh, we'll move on. But thank you so much to uh, Lauren and uh, Julian for that. It's fantastic. So we are now going to move on to, I'm going to introduce you to Cara Overy. 
Nice to introduce you to Caro. She is a musician and um, a sustainable sustainability professional based in Edinburgh. In her role as a carbon management planning officer with Creative Carbon Scotland, she supports cultural organisations with admissions reporting, carbon management and planning, and has recently led the Carbon Friendly Culture, a development project exploring how creative economies and communities responds to climate emergency in the view to develop a digital tool to support environmental creative practice. Over to you, Caro. Thanks very much, Polly. And thanks so much to everyone for being here today. It's really interesting so far. And I hope that I can continue um, that theme. So I've just, uh, I'm going to use a few slides. Um, and in order to do that, I need to just uh, start that. Sorry about this. Uh, there we go. Lovely. So today, yes, I'm hoping to cover an idea of how and when to measure carbon. So this is designed as a bit of a practical guide. I will give you a bit of background on Creative Carbon Scotland, um, since that is mainly what I'll be talking about what we've learned. I'll tell you a little bit about what we've learned from the carbon footprint in the cultural sector across Scotland. And I'll also give you a opportunity to explore an idea that we've been using uh, which might be more appropriate for kind of individual makers and smaller organizations um, and maybe people working in yeah and in, in that kind of setting so um first of all in terms of creative carbon scotland we are a scottish charity we were formed in 2011 and our work is with artists organizations and strategic bodies both nationally and internationally uh, the fundamental belief that we have is that arts and culture have an essential role in achieving the transformational change that we all need towards a sustainable future. Um, so the kind of outcomes we're working towards is that obviously we're focused around Scotland, but we have that kind of wider reach as well. Uh, the cultural sector will be implementing ambitious plans to mitigate carbon emissions and adapt to the future climate in line with national targets. We want the cultural sector to be recognised as an essential actor in achieving that transformational change and that more organisations out with the cultural sector will seek to work with those in the cultural sector um, to really kind of for culture to be able to play that key role. Um, and the way that we work is around enabling the cultural sector to understand the impacts of climate change and how they can contribute. Um, developing new connections between non-cultural actors, as in environmental organisations, policy bodies and such, and arts organisations and artists, and also in terms of expertise, research and advocacy to bring about sustainable change. So that's a bit of background on CCS. Um, in particular today, I'll be referring quite a bit to a development project that I've been carrying out that was actually supported by Creative Informatics and Creative Edinburgh, which was around exploring the creative community's response to the climate emergency um, and working to develop a tool and to sort of take that discovery phase really around developing a digital tool to support environmental creative practice. Uh, within the project, I was able to kind of use my dual roles and networks, as um, Polly mentioned at the start, I'm also a musician, as well as working in uh, the more sort of technical side of environmental sustainability. Um, and through the project, I spoke with artists, I spoke with the Green Champions at different organisations that I've been working with. I carried out a survey across Scotland of those working in the arts, and I was able to collaborate with a developer to produce early concept sketches for a digital tool, which I'm now happy to say I have a bit more funding to continue the development of. So um, moving on to yeah, what we've learned with Creative Carbon Scotland over the years. Um, so in Scotland, organisations that are regularly funded by Creative Scotland have been reporting their carbon emissions since 2015. So these are emissions from energy, travel and waste. So they don't include kind of embodied emissions um, because they are harder to count. Uh, as the previous speaker spoke about, that's, you know, it's, it's just not always due to the complexity of supply chains, uh, the shifting sort of what you might actually be making at the time. Uh, it's actually a really hard area to measure emissions in. Um, so, so far we have focused around energy travel and waste. Um, and here you can see a bit of a visual summary of what's been going on. So the year 2019 to 20 is the year at the top uh, and the year 2014 to 15 is the year at the bottom. 
there are 136 organizations represented in this data, in these data. Um, the encouraging thing that you will notice is that there is a reduction overall. So um, in 2019 to 20, the carbon footprint of all of these organizations across Scotland was something like half what it was in the first year that we measured it. This is just a snapshot though. So we have to bear in mind that there are limitations to this. Um, we've got a underlying emission factors you, you may or may not know do change from year to year. Um, and that's to do with the way that our energy is generated when it's on the national grid. Um, so we know that uh, some of that reduction will be down to that, but a lot of that reduction is down to organizations taking action um, doing things like changing the infrastructure of their buildings and um, changing their processes and practices um, to be more sustainable so that that reduction can't be entirely discounted but we need to show a little caution around this and um, the other thing you may notice so the green which is the energy and utilities shows a beautiful downwards curve however the uh, light blue on the left is travel and actually across all the cultural organizations that we've worked with Cultural um, travel is really this kind of quite stubborn um, presence in the cultural carbon footprint as a whole. Um, and so that's something to kind of bear in mind as we move forward in this discussion. And um, equally, waste, you can see rather similarly to energy and utilities, has gradually reduced over time. And um, so that will be partly to do with the way that organizations are managing their waste. Uh, a lot have are now able to recycle the vast majority of what they're generating and a lot of them had made a lot of efforts to reduce the waste that they're generating in the first place and um, rather continuing the theme of travel you can see on the pie chart on the right hand side uh, that flights are third <laughs> when it comes to um how they contribute to the overall profile so that's all of the emissions across all five years and we've got electricity is the the sort of top one electricity and gas which, you know, we work with some quite large theatre companies and large listed buildings that will tend to have quite high energy footprints. So we would expect to see that. But aside from that, flights are pretty, pretty significant. Um, to give you a little bit more. Oh, dear. Oh, sorry. I clicked on something that I should not have. There we go. Hopefully you can still see that. Um, so in terms of the existing data, uh, we dug in, I dug in a little bit more deeply to find out what the variation between art form is like and discovered that actually it's less significant than whether an organization operates premises. So across all these organizations, like I said, there's 136, the footprints run anywhere from one ton to 750 tons. So that's quite a large range of footprints that we're working with there. And all of the, it, it's just, it's a very diverse range. So there are various factors that might influence uh, their footprints and less than 40% of those organizations actually do operate premises. So that's something for us to think about as well. Um, performing arts tenant footprints, as we call them. So those who don't operate premises are dominated by travel. And we maybe see a slightly higher waste footprint in visual arts, multi-arts and theater, which we might expect to see really, um, given what they do. And there's a steady reduction in utilities and waste with stubborn and somewhat erratic travel emissions across the board. Um, so there is some influence from emission factor changes, as I've mentioned, and we need to remember this is still a relatively small sample size. It's not 136, it's not vast, and it's self-reported data as well. So that's a couple of things to bear in mind. And um, when it comes to what else might influence the footprint, this is some thinking that I was doing as part of the Climate Friendly Culture Project. We're thinking about how similar footprint might interweave with similar opportunities that organizations have. So looking at uh, the site and the ownership of the premises might be a particular kind of something that contributes to a larger footprint. And um, also staff numbers, that just gives you an indicator of the scale of the operation. Uh, then there's the geographic focus, so where you might be traveling to. So when travel is such a large part of that wider cultural carbon footprint, we're thinking about you know, who is traveling where and how, how much, how is, how is that sort of taking up carbon? Um, and equally, the audience and participant reach. Um, so if you are an organization that's reporting emissions around participants attending your workshops, then you might see that those travel emissions become reasonably significant. Um, 
audience emissions wouldn't necessarily be included in the reporting and um, they're not part of the organization's core emissions. Um, but it's something to consider if we want to consider those wider reductions that we will need to make. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, the organization focus could be something like community arts, or it could be exhibiting, or it could be a museum, for example. So that's the more kind of what the, the kind of audiences that they're working with. And then the art form, um, as I said, may not have much. It, there, there's not a lot you can tell about the art form when it comes to the carbon footprint. However, the um, opportunities for reduction might be quite similar. So that's what I was thinking about the sort of what has what organizations might have similar footprints and what uh, what might influence the opportunities that they have, which leads me on to tell you a little bit um, about the problems with carbon management. So not to argue myself out of a job exactly, but there are various challenges when it comes to counting carbon, which actually Lauren and Julian both touched on very well um, in the previous presentation. Um, so. We're working with really diverse emission sources and um, also within the arts. I thought it was quite interesting what Julian was saying about um, individuals kind of working on a on a project by project basis. You'll be working with different materials and sometimes it's more about the the sort of underlying principles of the way that you work rather than the sort of the product as you as you might sort of see it, the physical output. And um, so we have to always be aware that you might have the same organization having to make different calculations when it comes to carbon. There is also a lack of common general understanding. So if I was to ask you if you thought it would be more expensive to buy a pint of milk from a shop or a meal out in a restaurant, you would probably be able to tell me which of those things you thought was more expensive. But if I was to ask you what is higher carbon, uh, I don't know, like a disposable coffee cup or uh, the production of a keep cup, you, you might not really know and and that's completely normal that's that's kind of the world that we work in and so that lack of common general understanding is is a challenge it's a specialist area and there are lots of tools out there and lots of methodologies um, and also when it comes to culture the good news is that we actually have a reasonably small footprint when it comes to comparison with other sectors like large manufacturing um maybe sort of corporations that span different countries and borders and such so there's that side of things. And we have a challenge when it comes to capacity, the amount of time it takes to research the decisions you want to make. And um, so those are challenges. Um, and I want to sort of confess to them right now, um, rather than pretend that I have a solution for everyone that's going to work perfectly. So I do have a little bit of advice on when it is sensible to count. Um, so processes and things that you use or intend to use a lot are quite sensible to calculate the emissions of those because they're something that you're going to refer back to. One off uses when you know that they're going to be significant. So, for example, I was working with an ensemble recently who have been invited to play in America and their normal carbon footprint is just from touring around Scotland. And so they're looking at the tons of carbon that it's going to be for the three of them to travel to and from the states uh, by plane when they don't normally travel by plane so that's something where they will want to calculate the carbon emissions associated with that journey even if they don't intend to do it on a regular basis and um, the other thing is to remember that you know we are living through a climate emergency uh, it might be sensible to prioritize reduction and support that kind of wider transformation a more collaborative approach um, which hopefully can drive reduction across the board. Um, so those are things to bear in mind uh, because carbon management is not the whole story. So, however, this could be one way of telling <laughs> the whole story. This was a working definition that I put together as part of the Climate Friendly Culture Project. And these three kind of elements, I think, are quite significant when it comes to telling that story of what, what is climate friendly. And carbon efficiency is definitely part of the story. So doing what we do with as few emissions as possible. In Scotland, we're working towards a 2045 net zero target, preferably earlier where possible. The UK as a whole, it's 2050. Um, in Scotland, the target is lower because we have higher capacity to engage with that target. So it's, yeah, it, I'm sure that we would also like to think we're more ambitious in some ways, but it's a lot to do with the capacity that the country has in terms of its renewable energy capacity, for example. Um, influence. Culture is a really complex ecosystem of organizations, 
artists, freelancers, technicians, producers, audiences, makers, and we need to take that into account. So climate and also within that influence, it's about our influence on each other, our influence on our audiences and participants, and also more widely, we need to remember that climate change will negatively impact those around the world with the least resources to deal with it. So maintaining that angle of climate justice throughout as well, and it fits within that influence that we have. And um, when it comes to adaptation as well, climate change is already happening. And um, just before we came on the, the main call, um, I was mentioning how in Edinburgh on Sunday, we had half of our month's rainfall happen in an hour, uh, which kind of was a, quite an unpredictable weather event, you could say. And there's definitely a trend in definitely in Scotland, our local climate, we expect to get warmer, wetter and wilder. So not only do our plans need to withstand extreme circumstances, but unpredictable extreme circumstances, because we don't necessarily know it's going to happen. And we need to adapt and adapt flexibly. So those are the sort of the three leading concepts that I hope we can uh, sort of tie together as one. Um, so an idea that I came up with through Climate Friendly Culture and had the uh, good fortune to test out with um, the Piano Drome, who are an organisation in Edinburgh, um, as well as an artist, Katrina Patience, and with National Museums of Scotland, uh, was this a more qualitative approach to carbon management, um, which so far I've called footprint mapping. Um, it's based on the sort of core ideas that I've explained at the top of identifying the emissions sources and their measurability, then mapping whose emissions they are, then establishing what data collection and monitoring you want to do, and then finally that all important reduction planning and just focusing our minds on that idea. So it might be appropriate for smaller organizations and artists, rather than focusing on counting every single kilogram to actually determine the bounds of what you want to calculate and then work with others to identify spaces where that kind of influence circle almost. I've used Stephen Covey's spheres of control, influence and concern, which I learned in a management training workshop a long time ago now, um, but they're really useful for thinking about this because you can think of those emissions that you pay for and cause as being very control focused. So the kind of the what you're using, whereas your influence is that where it comes from, others who use the same source of emissions, maybe you share a venue or a studio space with another maker, and you want to think about the energy consumption of that, that space, but it doesn't, it's not a space that you physically own. So that gives you space to think about those emissions just there. And whereas your circle of concern is that broader kind of infrastructure issues of maybe your energy and transport infrastructure. So just how low carbon is the grid that, um, that you're connected to. Maybe, you're, maybe you have a renewable energy installation on site, um, which would obviously be ideal. <laughs> so thinking about those kind of wider, where those things come from, what transport is available. Uh, so are you, can you afford, are you able to access electric vehicles, for example, or lower carbon ways of doing things. Um, so thinking about um, those, uh, those sort of three circles, um, I've ran this workshop with, like I say, with Piano Drone, and I'll share the Katrina Patience bits just next. Um, but ideally, this system allows for those blurry boundaries. Um, it allows for you to have the, to feel it rather than to necessarily calculate before you think. Um, so it allows you to, to say, well, I think I have influence over that, but I'm not sure I need to think about who I need to speak to and gives you that space to think with this model. And hopefully it stimulates action and collaboration because for a lot of the cultural sector, we'll find that most of our emissions do fall in that influence section and we need to collaborate in order to reduce them. So just to briefly touch upon an example. Uh, so I worked with Katrina Patience on the Climate Friendly Culture Project is an emerging multimedia artist and she had an idea to um, use paints that were created from food waste and to reuse waste paper um, as her kind of paper that she was making marks on um, and foraging texture. So things like dried flowers and salt and such. Um, and she framed all of her works in reused mounts. And it was, these pieces were to serve as gifts for the artists that I'd interviewed uh, through Climate Friendly Culture. And it was just a way of trying out an idea for her. And 
as part of it, we mapped the footprint of these uh, works together to get a better understanding of the process and for me to be able to try out this um, this system, basically. Um, so you can see here, initially, it was about identifying those emission sources. So with her paper making, um, she was using a blender, she was using water, so those are energy and utilities, so they're coloured in green, and then dried flowers, so that's kind of a material, so that's purple, and the used paper, uh, that pink with the orange around is around reuse. Um, so it kind of gives you that practical example of how she'd thought about her emission sources and categorise them by energy, travel, waste, materials and reuse. And then she mapped them on to control, influence and concern. As you can see in this particular example, because she's working with materials that are generally either reused or immediately to hand, a lot of it falls under her control. Um, whereas the things that fall out of her control tend to be the transportation and the travel side of things. And um, so transport of materials and delivery of finished work, which she has a little influence over, but not, not fully. And the same with transportation of materials. That's not something that her as an individual, she can't, she can't necessarily control that. So that's kind of a little taster of the model. And I wonder if I could just invite a little interaction um, just to see uh, what your kind of thoughts are. If anybody has any thoughts on any sources of emissions. So thinking about those energy, travel, waste and materials sources. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts. Um, would you like you us might... to do this, Cara? Would you like us to shout them out or put them in the chat? What's what's the best way? Putting, to them, in the, putting them in the chat would be great. Or if you'd like to raise your hand and then speak verbally, I'm also fine with that. Okay. Um, so... Oh, sorry. I've done that. Am I going to see that? Oh, there we go. Sorry. There we go. Now I've got that open. That's good. Um, I'll just um, <laughs> I in terms of Potter's sorry I'm trying to just see if I can yes I can um yes I don't know if anyone had any so energy use from kilns I did previously work at Edinburgh University where they had some very large kilns in ECA um and yes uh yeah Jody. Yeah, I've been measuring um, my energy use from my kiln for a while now. Yeah. And I'm kind of struggling with what, where to go next, because I, you know, it's very difficult to look at your scape two emissions. Because yes. there's, you know, we've asked Scarva and def different suppliers of materials, ceramic materials for their sustainability policies, and they don't have them. And I was yeah. wondering if you'd done any like if you've been working on any collaborative projects to try and work out what the emissions are, because pottery is a really energy intensive thing, like kilns are really, really energy intensive. Yeah. And so I know as a sector, like drawing and sculpting and all those things, like there's lots of people using reclaimed materials. And as a potter, I recycle all my materials I can mm. um, and have a kind of quality control process where I don't fire anything unless I need to. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of really difficult to know where to go other than like measuring your electric use and making sure you're on a true green supplier. So not just a re go back to green supplier, but a proper green supplier who is investing in new renewables. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that would be the starting point definitely around understanding. Yeah. We generally say understanding is sort of the, the step. And then if there's any way of, I suppose in that particular instance, uh, it's always about doing what you do. So maintaining your sort of truth to your practice is you are still a potter. <laughs> but um, in terms of, is there a way of sharing those facilities with others or kind of more, I would suggest potentially looking to that sort of collaboration or as you identify that sort of influencing side. So to apply this model, you'd be thinking of that that influence side of identifying others who use the same source of electricity or the same, have the same problem basically, and getting together and asking for those suppliers to start giving you more information. Um, so we have an example in Scotland, I'm actually gonna use a music example, but the Scottish Classical Sustainability Group rely a lot on coaches, for example, to move around 
the country and that's that's the most efficient way of transporting their ensembles however um they're all running on fossil fuels so they're sort of lobbying basically lobbying the suppliers and the um higher companies in scotland for electric alternatives and i don't know i'm not quite sure how you would apply that to um to your own situation but maybe working with others in the green makers initiatives initiative to um to compare so partly to compare what um emissions you you're measuring and so you know sort of saying is this a similar thing to other people's energy use but also getting together to kind of find out are there common suppliers that you're using that you where you want those that information um and that there, there will be yeah, yeah. there yeah, are so, common suppliers but it's very difficult to influence them as an individual maker and yeah. But it might be, um, Jody. just going to break in here, I don't know where you're based, but it might be uh, a body of potters, uh, ceramicists around in your area that get together, or it might be that uh, we have a company conversation with Craft Potters Society. You know, there's lots of kind of different ways that um, uh, certainly myself as somebody who makes ceramic things and teaches it, et cetera, and has massive kilns, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it is a real, it is an issue, um, but it's, an, it's quite interesting to think about how we, yeah, that influence. Yeah. Place. yeah I think craft potters is a good idea because yeah. it's that mass thing isn't it and there are local networks I used to work in a community pottery and we used to share kiln facilities and that's great until someone puts some clay in there that's not right for that temperature and then it melts all over the kiln and then you end up having to buy new kiln bricks and they have to come from Germany and yeah you know before you know it you've got a whole lot of embedded carbon resulting from that yeah. Yeah. But then maybe so. So maybe the the action there would be around about a group of people getting together, uh, say where you are, or thinking about. Uh, yeah, it is always influence in not one but many. It could be a good a good project to kind of continue with. Mm. Yeah. Does that give you some useful thoughts, Jodie? Yeah, I think you're right about the influence thing. Like, you know been thinking about writing about it for some time because I haven't seen any other potters writing about carbon emissions from kilns mm -hmm. and that's you know on your diagrams like everything it's always the energy use that's the biggest chunk mm -hmm. so that's a kind of logical thing but I haven't seen anyone else actually investigating that which is why I signed up to this because I thought I might find other people other yeah. potters who might be thinking about this or who want to think about it perhaps yeah is there anyone else there? Is there anyone else with the? That might be. Maybe I, just from the University of Plymouth's uh, point of view, in our course, I'd certainly be interested in getting together and thinking about how we can develop that as a project. Great. Well, I'm just up the road on Dartmoor, so okay. give me a shout. Yeah. yeah. No, that's really good. Um, so I think, um, yeah, and like Emma says, you know, there are sort of the, um, there might be other, ah, right. So, yeah, there'll be different temperatures depending on the material, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll have to, yeah. Um, but it's good to kind of, you know, you can see the sort of identifying the issue rather than kind of necessarily going straight into the calculation. You can kind of say, well, this is something that I'm working with. This is what I control. This is what I can calculate. Mm. And then this is the sort of space where you can collaborate with others. Um, oh, and a new website called KilnShare. I yeah I'm not I'm sorry I'm not sharing my kiln after that experience of having melting stuff all over a shared kiln yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> too much <laughs> yeah that yeah very stressful <laughs> really yeah, yeah. Re and really expensive as well yeah. like too yeah. much I can't afford yeah. that yeah no exactly um that's interesting so thanks for that um I am going to move us on just the suggested actions that I would say for things that you find to be in these different circles so this is you know a model for everyone across the whole cultural sector um but that for the control you'd be looking at measuring and setting a carbon budget so that would be the bits where you specifically do measure things um and we have carbon calculators through creative carbon scotland there are plenty widely available um, and reducing those emissions through practical actions first and trying to share your progress and reporting on those emissions with basically any, you know, anybody that you're working with or in your sort of general narrative as well. 
When it comes to influence, that's a really chunky and significant bit about identifying the owners of the emissions. Capturing the quantitative and qualitative data about your progress as well. So it, it can be as significant to identify the other people that you need to work with to create this wider change or to engage with that certain supplier whose performance you want to change. That can be more significant sometimes than reducing a small, you know, maybe, you know, switching to a, a small of a small bit of your control emissions. Um, and then finally, when it comes to concern, it is all about that wider connection with the community and the sector to advocate for change and keeping up the research and staying informed. And that I think should help. <laughs> um, so yes, that's a pretty much everything that I was going to cover um, today. So it just, um, yes, I did have points to consider just, yeah, around thinking about what your understanding and reducing the emissions um, within your circle of control might look like and thinking about what you include in your circle of influence as a way to identify collaborators and actions. So I hope that was useful um, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Caro. Um, we've got a little bit of time for any more questions. Anything that we want to ask Caro at this stage? Any questions, put them in the chat. Um, Lauren, over to you. Thanks, Caro. That was really, really interesting presentation. Like, and also good to sort of know sort of the frameworks that you're using and then how it's been a applied is really useful so I think if that's sharing that um I had a, a kind of two questions the first is a, is a logistical one like when you did the mapping for the music group mm -hmm. you know what was the like kind of time frame is it like how long does it take to to do that effectively with, yeah. with a group um and like and then think about how that can be done by individual you know because it feels like such a useful activity but it's like how do people actually kind of engage with it um without a specialist knowledge or is is that kind of specialist knowledge of, of talking through things really key yeah. um and then I have I have a second one about kind of the the audience capturing potentially capturing audience carbon footprint uh -huh. but maybe we can come back to that afterwards yeah sure yeah um so I've used that three times that uh, control influence concern uh, National Museum Scotland that was a commissioned workshop so it was with a particular there were about 15 to 17 people in the group and we split them into smaller groups and then they spent probably about 10 minutes identifying the sources of emissions and then another 10 to 15 minutes placing them. Um, but then the discussion about what to do with them then takes another, I would say, at least half an hour or so and follow up action points and such as well, um, which is kind of the idea. So that's that's fine. Um, Katrina Patience, who was the artist that I worked with on the on those pieces she actually did it herself um and I think it took her sort of under an hour really to engage with that resource and to kind of think about what the control influence and concern meant for her and um, like I say it's quite a sort of almost feelings led process so some people will feel that they're in control of something even though you know that's not really part of the way that you would calculate their carbon footprint which it, that can be a slightly interesting thing to navigate and I think sometimes when you're using these tools though you have to provide things that people can just use and just and go by what what they think and um, so I don't know that's for discussion then um the piano drone they they actually are an they created an amphitheater from pianos that would otherwise have gone to landfill which may sound completely bonkers but it does exist <laughs> um, and they were looking at identifying their emission sources they're a really interesting group um and there were only three of them but I gave them the background bit as well. So I gave them a sort of talk about the cultural carbon footprint and that took about an hour and a half. And then they were still going to have to create the kind of report, like their sort of plan for data collection and monitoring, which is, that was a little bit tr trickier, I think, but partly due to the nature of the beast of, yeah, lots of a mixture of materials, travel, all sorts. So yeah, does that help? Yeah, yeah, it's just really interesting to think about like the different approaches, like the, the kind of specialist led one and then a, a more kind of individually driven one. Yeah. That's yeah. really interesting. Um, I'm aware, there are some other questions. I don't know if other people want to ask those and I can come back to my slightly more kind of abstract one later. Cool. So we've yeah. got a question from Emma. Do you want to say anything, Emma? Shall I just pass it on? Either. Okay. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, fantastic, Caro. That's brilliant to, to have that overview and, and a different, uh, the qualitative approach, I think, and feeling your way into carbon footprint um, measurement and monitoring. Um, within that, there is the, the kind of uh, measurement of it as well. So, and I just wondered, people are always asking what carbon footprint calculators would you recommend for small makers? Uh, it's a slightly boring question, but I think it's a kind of a practical one as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would say it depends what you're trying to measure. So uh, when it comes to materials, it, it's really quite hard to measure um, because it obviously depends on the supply chain and the different um, suppliers that you're working with. Um, and also the bearing in mind that the manufacturer kind of bears the brunt of those emissions in a way. And should, you know, when it comes to sort of traditional carbon reporting, it's the manufacturer who is absorbing the majority of those emissions. And you are as an individual just have this little portion here but of course you have the sort of buying responsibility the procurement responsibility to choose the good suppliers that have smaller sections over here so um but i would say i i'm not aware of any that work purely on the materials side um however when it comes to the the wider side there we've got the carbon management planning tool from creative carbon scotland there's um, Julie's Bicycle have the creative green tools, which are really quite wide ranging. The Gallery Climate Coalition as well have a really nice, smooth and quite instant carbon calculator um, that I would recommend. And that's more visual arts focused, um, I would say. Uh, and aside from that, if you're looking for more individual stuff, um, Paw Print is really good. I'm not sure if people have come across that, but it is more... It's more individual and kind of energy, you know, your energy, your travel, your waste and such, and on a more individual scale. Um, so, but I would recommend having a look at all of those. Just with paw print, the functionality is brilliant and you can have it as an app and it's very quick to use. And definitely based on my interviews with um, the artists, everyone was, you know, everyone is struggling for capacity all the time. So things that are quick and easy to use are a win. <laughs> So those are my yeah those are my sort of top tips <laughs> uh, it sort of moves on to what we, chris i don't know if you're there chris mm. um woodfield he was sort of following on are you there chris mm. no nope. um he was following in about so that you you mentioned about high level of travel yeah. um, seeing, um and, and how that you know what well with sort of i suppose we know why that is but do you know of any initiatives that are exploring this i um, I would say that each kind of element of that uh, sector kind of has to have its own conversation around it. So within the data we were looking at, that's across the cultural sector. And a lot of that is driven by touring, by theatre, um, yeah. music. Some of it is freight. So some of it will be for things like exhibitions as well. Um, but a lot of it is a lot of individuals travelling um, and a lot of that comes down to this very fundamental and transformational changes that we need to consider as a society of like, you know, if you're going to go on tour, if you're going to have like international collaborations, then we need to think about the way we can make the most of that travel and really, you know, plan in um, solid community engagement when it comes to if you're hosting an artist or hosting an exhibition just thinking about the value that that can give for the local community and the and and the sort of how that how that works um, and maintaining the global connections that we all thrive on as well we all thrive on connection and collaboration and I don't think anyone should be suggesting that we turn our back on that um, yeah. but yeah, I, so I would say main reasons are touring side of things, but yeah. there's definitely an issue with the transportation of. Uh, well, I was going to say, yeah, the infrastructures yeah. and and how yeah. that is working, uh, and that's the sort of policy based information, yeah. isn't it, etc. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Cara. I don't know if we've really got more, more questions. We will have. I think we might have a little bit of time at the end um, for a few more questions as well. Um, but we're going to move on to our last speakers. Our last speakers are Jane uh, Hebbo and Susan Moores from Plymouth Scrap Store. Plymouth Scrap, Sh Scrap Store is a community interest company set up as a play association 25 years ago, becoming a social enterprise and community interest company in 2011. It's managed by a board of trustees and run by paid leaders 
and has a team, an amazing amount of team of uh, volunteers who collect a mixture of objects and materials that are destined for the land, uh, landfill or recycling, which are given an opportunity for a new adventure. So I'm going to pass you over to Jane and Susan. Over to you. Thank you, Polly. So Thank first you. of all, um, Susan, are you going to sort of kick us off? Yeah. So I'm just going to say at the moment that I um, am one of the three company directors. My own background is in youth and community work, trained in the early 90s, and I discovered Plymouth Scrap Store myself when I needed to place uh, young volunteers on an international cross-cultural exchange in 2009. And I have been involved uh, after having been headhunted by Jane and her colleagues way back then. I've been involved for 10 years. I'm going to speak about the second part of our presentation today. So I'm now going to hand you back to Jane and um, let her tell you the first part. So thank you, everybody, for um, inviting us here this afternoon to tell us uh, to tell you our story. So, as we said, I'm Jane and I'm one of the original co-founders of Plymouth Scrap Store. Um, now retired, I'm now to be found mainly behind the scenes at the Scrap Store. So ours has been a journey of discovery. We have been operating our scrap store here in Plymouth for between 25 and 27 years, depending on what we can remember. It's changed and developed as time has gone on, mainly due to our members' requests. When we started out, our main aim was to provide affordable, accessible, interesting and exciting resources for play. So nothing much has changed, really. What started out as a project to provide right resources to after school clubs, uh, play groups, etc., soon became a magnet and a haven for all sorts of artists, creatives, and makers. As a social enterprise, we formally recognised our status in 2011 when we became a community interest company. We've been providing employment, volunteering, and saving a wealth of interesting things from landfill and making sure it had a place to go. So when we were invited to come along today, I had a, a think about, you know, how do we fit into this um, whole makers and artists uh, offer? So can you remember the first thing that you ever made? Um, how excited you felt? And can you remember what it was made from? Um, I was thinking there's probably a very good chance that it wasn't made from new materials, but something from the box at Playgroup or from your nan's repairing basket or even an empty box under the stairs. So you can see where this is going. What came next? When did your creativity start demanding new materials? How you scrimped and saved? And then how does your practice shape the person you are? Is your art and creativity a reflection of you as a person? So our next question for you to think about is, as a creative, a designer or maker, why would you want to use a scrap store rather than buying new? Think of this, for us, play and creativity go hand in hand. Young children love the excitement of loose parts, those amazing bits of loveliness that don't dictate how they are played with, versus the very prescribed toys. For us, these children are no different to any other creative, playful person looking for something that grasps their imagination and allows the freedom to be creative. Often what we have to offer cannot be gathered from other places good reason to use a scrap store. When looking at Plymouth's cultural plan, we found out that early childhood experiences and encounters of any kind have a profound effect on the future outcomes, none more so than creative and cultural encounters. Plymouth wants their cultural offer to integrate with the schools and education providers so that every young person has access to art, culture and creativity in the curriculum. Additionally, they want creativity to be embedded in all subjects so that we can develop creative thinkers, agile problem solvers and resilient future leaders. So why would you then want to buy new when you can have the opportunity to buy something beautiful with a history and a story to tell? Another medium to let your imagination run wild, inspiring its next adventure. I know this afternoon we've, we've talked about narrative and the stories quite a lot. And that's um, really important to us in the scrap store. 
Affordability. We want everyone to be able to have the opportunity to be creative and playful. We don't want it to be something that's out of reach and accessible to the majority, achievable by only the chosen ones. So what does this all mean? It means that by using a scrap store, you have the opportunity to use some of the most unusual materials, textiles, pre-loved, deconstructed items possible. We source amazing things, often destined for landfill or recycling. We ensure that they are affordable and suitable, ready to go off on new adventures. By joining us, you are able to keep a community interest company going, make sure it's there for generations to come, and helping to tread lightly on the earth. We are part of a growing movement to save great things from the bin. There are scrap stores all over the country and we'll pop in the chat how you can find out whether there's one near you or not. But now I'm gonna pass over to Susan to talk about how we're moving forward with the times. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the collaborations we're involved in. And also just, to, I just want to really make three or four links to the previous speakers, just because just I think it's really useful for people to know where they may or may not want to come and source materials in the future. So one of our recent partnerships has been with the Repair Cafes, which will be a concept that most of you will be familiar with. We've got it on national TV, but locally we have got a partnership with Borrow Don't Buy and Time Bank Southwest to really bring a whole series of repair cafes to Plymouth and Devon. Unfortunately, COVID struck with that, but we will, we will when we've got those um, appropriate risk assessments in place in terms of meeting each other in, in small spaces and sharing across um, De short desk spaces we will get those back up and running another um interesting one that i think several of you will have heard of is the global open source collective around precious plastics so precious plastics plymouth and tavistock we got that going during lockdown funnily enough we got a small grant to start that off with a, a series of supporters and collaborators and during the nine month, well, during the nine month grant process, we really managed to make quite a significant um, set of partnerships. And re really, we've started something that we didn't really expect to grow quite as much. But yeah, please look for Precious Plastics, Plymouth and Tavistock. And we've got a Facebook page and we've got a space with the machinery down at the Royal William Yard and just in the last month they've had two events where Ursula and Kate have made soap dishes from recycled uh, plastics and one of our links there is the Fab Lab and Smart Citizens Programme which obviously linked to Plymouth University and then the third one just in terms of a future to let you all know about because you never know whether people on this call have got children and grandchildren or nieces and nephews but we are very much part of the fit and fed campaign that will be going out in all of Plymouth parks over this summer in terms of the the, the idea of creative play and then Mar Marcus Rashford's campaign to make sure that some of those children that often aren't fed properly in school holidays are actually fed properly so we're really proud to be taking our junk modeling and um, creative play sessions out to 10 parks over the summer holidays. And then just really to finish, before we show you a quick video, I just wanted to make four points that I link that I think link with some of the other speakers' comments, which are if, if there are concerns around your the, the concern of influence that the last speaker spoke about, I think our place in the circular economy that we often don't necessarily um, articulate because it's not the way we generally speak but the whole thing about reducing consumption being mindful about where our supply chains how we're recycling how we want to maximize those cycles I think we do that naturally um, by what Jane is showing there that we've been turning saving waste from landfill and turning it into loveliness for 25 or 27 years so I think we've got a place in that that might help you think about where you want to source some of your materials from and help with that carbon footprint. Uh, you talked about sharing and scaling. 
as James just mentioned, we're part of a national movement called Reuseful UK. So those of you that aren't in Devon, there are scrap stores all over the country and it'll be worth you finding out where yours is if you're interested in what we are doing. And then I think the fact that we are adaptable and flexible in our business model means that we can be tiny, we can be mobile, we can be massive. And it, it's that it's that flexibility that's allowed us to continue for 27 years and hope that we're here for at least 27 more. And, and then I personally, I was really interested by what Julian talked about, about the whether we get into the concept and, or whether we get into doing the best that we can with the resources we've got around in terms of sustainability. And I really like that idea that we do what we can whilst being mindful of sustainable practices. And I think that's where we would say that we position ourselves is we don't try to claim something that we're not, but we do in our intention to be part of the sustainable sustainability and green movement we do as we've just said there exactly what we can whilst being mindful and for those of you on the call that have never set foot inside a scrap store we thought that we'd like to finish our bit by showing you um, a very quick video of inside the store on union street so i really hope that um I'm able to do this. And if it doesn't work, I know we've got a backup plan, but bear with me while I just get this on your screens. And then this is Plymouth Scrap Store right now in its remodeled um, version as we prepared ourselves to come out of the pandemic and lockdown times in a way that was safe for our customers and suppliers and volunteers and staff team. So let's hope it works. Here we go. We're going to go really quick because so this is some lovely coloured netting. There's some sewing, some stuff on the thing. There's loads of materials. Oops. Get all of this stuff from this door to be safe from landfill. So I think what you can see there is that some of our donations come from known um, known manufacturers and retailers like the Lush Boxes, but lots of our donations come from people that kind of want to make sure that they are also contributing to thinking about where they get rid of their stuff before it goes into possibly landfill or, or anywhere else that we'd rather take it from. And um yeah, I mean, there's lots more we could say, but I think un unless Jane wants to say anything else, I'm going to knock it on the head there, as they say. Thanks. Jane, would you like to say anything? No, I think um, when we came onto this call originally, before everybody else joined us, we said that we would like to be the, the memorable pudding at the end. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully, this has just given you a little taste everybody of what we have to offer and if anybody's got um 
<laughs> I'm just reading some of the chat comments. It's lovely. <laughs> if anybody would like to come and see us, please do so. Um, you've got our details and we can do private um, private shopping tours as well as our ordinary open days as well. So a quick plug for us and all our scrap store friends. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to open uh, for questions because there are a few, uh, and I'm curious about this as well, Julian. So I'm going to ask the question that Julian put in the chat here about um, how much particular materials do you keep in stock and how do you decide what to keep and how, you know, what you get rid of, I suppose, as well? We actually get rid of very, very little. Um, we have suppliers who donate on a regular basis. They will contact us when they have an amount of stuff for us to, to go and pick up so that we don't go and waste their time or ours because obviously it, it's costly. Um, if we're offered a large amount of something just too lovely for us to say to them, no, we're not going to take all of it. Um, we will take it on the understanding that we can share it out with other scrap stores. So we have um, scrap store swaps where we would um, most recently we met up in Bristol. So there's maybe four or five across the country. So people don't have to travel so far and everybody takes their van full of stuff. It all gets put out and then everybody can help themselves from other scrap stores. So we get that lovely variety across the country and that gets spread on to other places. But no, we we take we take all sorts of loveliness. Very rarely do we say no. And very, very rarely do we have to get rid of anything. It all has a life with somebody. Fantastic. I'm always interested in uh, you know, that aspect of how you get rid of things, but also I suppose in regards to when you use them, um, I think something was brought up in one of the other um, sessions in regards to, I think it was with Julian actually, the quality of design and of course, uh, and the quality of the making. So when you are reusing and thinking about how you, what to do with that material, it, there is that kind of conversation about uh, designing in good quality design so that the materials also fit the sort of process of that. And I'm sure uh, many of us um, have seen recycled pieces that actually the design you know, element doesn't necessarily work. So it's about getting the combination right, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's also about when you take something that was going into landfill and then you do something to it, mm -hmm. it you can then actually um, influence its recyclability, if that's such a word. Mm -hmm. And so you have to think very carefully, I think, if you're you're going to take something actually by doing something to it. Are you giving it an extra life, an extra length of life? Or actually, are you shortening that life yeah. and affecting whether it can actually be recycled or not? So that's something else that um, we have. We have conversations with with quite a few people about, you know, many of us have got things stuck on our fridges that have been um had stuff put onto it which means that it could no longer be recycled yeah. uh, but if you've kept it for a very long time and you love it you know somebody quoted William Morris earlier and there is that whole thing about if it's not useful or beautiful or it has sentimental value then what do you do with it yeah absolutely it's fascinating yes about uh and I think it was um Lauren, right at the beginning, was talking about reusing and oh, the, the cycle of and how many times it can be cycled and recycled, etc., and how that fits in, which is, is really important. Um, but I suppose uh, on the kind of on the negative side, in there is that you know we can do so much ourselves and looking at um, what uh, Carol was saying about the kind of influence, etc. But actually, part of the influence would be about the, the manufacturing and who is making these things and, and why they're making possibly too much of whatever it is fantastic for the scrap stores but when we need to be thinking about uh, that yeah totally and um, it's something that we have again we have conversations about you know we would love for the the not to be all this stuff out there that needs to be collected by people like us and put out there for being reused in a different way to the way in which it was intended because it can't be used for that purpose anymore and there's a there's a huge movement at the moment isn't there about you know some of the big designers who would rather destroy something than um, put it out there to be sold cheaply there's lots of conversations to be had about you know, how all these things fit in isn't there about materiality and actually making sure yeah. good 
mine is is in there. Um, we uh, yeah, I mean yeah, you can start on it, but I won't. But <laughs> students of mine who are on this call will know um, how um, hardcore I am in regards to what are you doing with that? What's the purpose of etc. Anyway, uh, do we have any? Oh, thank you, Haley. Haley's put in the chat um, the directress uh, directress scrap stores and fantastic Susan. We know now when to come to Plymouth Scrap Store. That's fantastic. Uh, maybe Maddie can go on her own without somebody. <laughs> They're off. And um, Joseph, we make furniture using homegrown, sometimes local source for timber. Presumably, they can be carbon, concrete carbon. Yes offset and carbon we look up okay is there an offset with the carbon we lock up is there a question there joseph do you want to come into this and i saw you in the zoom earlier hi by the way it's great to see you on the where are you hi hello hi hi um yeah we, I, 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 I mean presumably if you're locking up carbon with you know within this within solid timber use that's does that is that part of the you know is that something you can put into the calculation? I suppose that's to our this um, Caro really. Caro, yeah, thanks. Yeah, Jessica. sure. Um, so hmm, interesting. Um, I would say if it's something that you're growing. Um, so I've worked with an organisation in Scotland who. Um, they're an arts organization. They have a, an orchard of 300 trees, for example, um, and they use a figure that, that basically it's what we call carbon sequestration when it's that direct um, because you've obviously got the, the actual stuff that's there. So you're, you're, you're thinking more about sequestration, which is kind of the on-site storing of it. Offsetting is more when you're paying someone else to right, do yeah. that thing. Um, which is a little bit more complex and it is yeah to be honest like when we're working with cultural organizations we tend to steer them as much as possible away from offsetting because it is there's no kind of gold standard for it so there's no sort of um, yeah there's no like so the FSC uh, forestry FSC we all know what that means right <laughs> they have a, um, a sort of estimation of what one tree uh, saves in its lifetime but it will always depend on the type of tree and where it is and it it is an estimate so we sort of have to be a little bit careful when we're saying oh well you know these people over here planted a tree therefore it's saving this much carbon because it's kind of a philosophical concept of like yes it's saving the carbon but the carbon that you're emitting you're still emitting so it's not you're not avoiding carbon emissions which is ultimately where we kind of want to be um, so I would, yeah, I would slightly caution against kind of offsetting schemes where you're you're paying another organisation to do that for you. Um, or if you are doing that, just making sure that it's one that's kind of local and doing and using nature based solutions in your local area. So within Scotland, we have a lot of potential for reforestation. So we have a charity that does reforestation across Scotland using native species um, that there's a couple of organizations that have set up partnerships with them and they make a set donation each year per kilogram of carbon dioxide equivalent. And that's a very sort of direct and quite circular, nice way of doing your carbon offsetting as it were. Um, but yeah, when it comes to kind of international law, it, it, it's a really muddy area and I don't know. Yeah. So I, I think it's probably, it's probably <laughs> yeah. a language, probably me and my use of, uh, of, of the word offsetting uh, um, I mean actually where we are part of an environmental charity working in forestry and um, yeah. uh, and, and, and making things out of wood as well now it's more about I suppose I was more thinking that if we can calculate all of our energy use and wastage etc yeah. actually if we're making things out of solid timber which actually is locking up carbon is that does that fit into our calculation at all as a yeah. so rather than it be lots of negatives we've actually got a positive yeah. at this stage in time i would advise you to calculate the scale of savings that you have from that timber that you've grown and sort of record it separately as sequestration so the example that i gave of um the organization that have this orchard they 
they know what the carbon saving is from that or the carbon it, it's the carbon sequestered within that and they know their emissions as an organization and they know that they are sequestering more carbon than they are emitting but they're still they're still saying yes we're emitting this this carbon but i would i would still veer towards presenting them as two different figures just for the sake of yeah. kind of avoiding that thing of saying oh well we're you know we're this we're that with it's the sort of how you term that because technically you could say you're carbon negative but there's a lot of people saying they're carbon negative and i think it's more effective to say to to tell the story more directly um and sure. and more kind of authentic maybe um, yeah great thanks thanks for that uh, we've just got one more question um, from Phil, who says, do you have any links to organisations I can contact around carbon offsetting per tonne, et cetera? Question mark. I can potentially take that one. So um, I would recommend, I came across an uh, exhibitions uh, company recently who were working with um, Climate Neutral um, who are linked with the UN. So the UN now has sort of global um, kind of guidance around a, the carbon offsetting side of things. So that that might be, a, that I would look to the, that resource. I'll just find a link and pop it in the chat. Fantastic. Okay, so I think we have got, so there's also people in Okay, um, I think we're gonna wrap up. Um, so, it's for me to say thank you so much for this fascinating workshop. I've certainly learned a lot. As I said, I've got so many notes here. I could be here forever asking questions. But I'd particularly like to thank, obviously, our speakers. So Julian, uh, Lauren, Caro, Jane and Susan. Thank you so much for that. Thank you also to Emma and Laura for developing this workshop and for the Green Initiative. I'm hoping maybe one of you could just put that link in the chat. That would be fantastic. Um, brilliant, thank you. Um, also to Hayley, who's our behind the scenes, but is now on, on oh, yeah, we can see you now, Hayley, for um, the co who is the uh, low carbon uh, Devon marketing and events officer. And of course, to you lot for attending. Uh, we really hope that you've enjoyed it and learned things and are gonna take things forward. And we'd really like to make sure that you all think about keeping in touch with us, sharing your stories, and um, thinking about how maybe this workshop has really helped you develop your sustainable low carbon studio. So thank you so much. And it's been joyful. I, and um, yeah, keep in contact. Um, can I just plug the next workshop, please? Oh, yeah. um, Holly, thank you. Um, just share this screen. So um, the next exciting workshop from the Green Maker Initiative is called Plastic Alchemy. And this picks up on something that uh, Jane and uh, Susan were talking about. So Kate Crawford um, will be running a um, workshop to learn about how you can transform recycled plastics into beautiful, sustainable designs. And this is a hands-on workshop at Ocean Studios. So it's limited spaces. You're going to have um, a sort of four to one, four to, four to three rather, um, uh, instruction. And it's going to be assisted by um, Ian and Oscar, uh, 3D design BA graduates um, as well. So that's going to be fantastic. So please sign up. Um, the details are on the uh, Low Carbon Devon website. Uh, Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And um, enjoy your evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Cool. Thank you. Excellent. Bye bye.